All right, sir. Thank you. I, I think I can move around, uh, move around ju just a little bit here. Uh, but uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate everybody's uh, continued participation, not, not just being here, uh, but your continued uh, participation uh, in these events. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, my ranger buddy and I w were talking about over there earlier is we think back to where we were. So he's been in his job a little over, little over a year, probably about 14 months or so. And uh, I've got about another year left on my scholarship, so on my three-year scholarship. So I've been in this job uh, for, uh, for about 24 months. And I think about kind of from whence we've come. The very first sit-down with General Milley, all right, the outfitting of SFABs with equipment that nobody else in the Army actually has a as a capability. Uh, the rollout of big ideas across the DOD in our, right before us, like the big idea of FirstNet. Had a, had a really good discussion uh, with Carl earlier. What we are doing almost one year ago, uh, about this time, uh, me and General Fogarty literally just start scratching at the idea of enterprise IT as a service, all right, which was really the very first time that the uh, third largest and most complex organization in the world, the United States Army, started to delve into the space of really corporately and trying to institutionalize this idea of an as-a-service model. So how those things happen? Uh, they happen because of you, all right? And I'm not uh, here to blow smoke uh, to, our, to our industry partners and our partners from academia. But I got to tell you that uh, those things would not have been possible were it not for you doing what we ask you to do. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, but that's illuminating the art of the possible. We know we can't do everything. I got it. All right. I understand that. But none of those things that I talked about uh, that the Army, not Crawford, not Fogarty, uh, have done, but that the Army has taken on would have been possible uh, without your continued partnership. So I just want to take the opportunity up front. Uh, to say, uh, listen, we're not there because there is no there there. And that's another, you know, aha moment for us over the last 24 months on what I consider to be the largest and most comprehensive review uh, of our networks from the enterprise to the tactical level uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, we're, we're on the front end of that now. But what I wanted to tell you over and over again, I say this every time I speak publicly and I never take it for granted, large group or small group, that uh, your contributions and your inputs uh, have literally uh, illuminated the art of the possible uh, for your United States Army. And so you ought to be pretty proud of that. Uh, much, more, much more work to be done, uh, but uh, you ought to be pretty proud of kind of where you brought us uh, so far. Uh, to AUSA, I was actually looking to step forward today, hoping General Ham was here, because I've been pretty critical of uh, all things Cleveland. Uh, I know he's, uh, he's got his Indians, and I was, uh, you know, looking forward to stepping before this august uh, audience and bragging about my Steelers being 2-0 uh, uh, at this point. And so uh, not only are we not 2-0, but turns out we, ju we just lost our quarterback uh, for, for the rest of the uh, season here. So interesting things uh, are, are, are abound here. But uh, please uh, let General Ham know uh, how much uh, we, ac we appreciate uh, from the evening dinner sessions, and I see some of our teammates here uh, from those sessions where we bring together industry uh, with, uh, with myself and General Forwardy uh, to, uh, to this event, uh, to what we're going to do uh, at AUSA uh, here. Um, it's not lost on me, and I know it's not lost on any of the other senior leaders for the Army, uh, how much, uh, how important uh, AUSA is in organizations like AUSA to kind of creating the environment where we can have the conversations uh, like uh, I just described in terms of our engagements with industry. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that I took the opportunity to make that point. Uh, our cyber. So, um, you know, I, it, it is not uh, show. Uh, and it is not just for effect uh, that my ranger buddy there, uh, Steve Fogarty, and I uh, spend a lot of time together working our way through the strategic issues of the day and, and tomorrow uh, for the Army. And uh, I, I wanted to make sure that I took the opportunity to kind of just talk about and at least mention the importance of that. Uh, there is nothing that we can get done uh, from the tactical edge uh, to the enterprise without being arm in arm uh, with each other. Do we have disagreements? All the time, all right? Uh, but where those disagreements occur and where the discussions occur is in his office 
or in my office where we decide to come together and figure out how, how we're going to move forward. And so uh, the combination, uh, so, so what does all this mean on the front end of this uh, in, in terms of the big idea? I think it's the understanding uh, of uh, the art of the possible uh, from industry. I think it's our willingness uh, to take advantage of uh, the strategic importance of forums and organizations like AUSA to make ourselves visible. Whether you agree with us or not, uh, we grow uh, when you put things on the table for us. And then the third big piece has been our decision, okay, a corporate decision uh, to work together uh, privately and publicly. That's kind of been the springboard that's led us to be kind of where we are right now which is, again, there is no there there, but we are significantly north of where we were uh, about 24 months ago uh, when General Milley, uh, a little over 24 months ago, when he called us together for the very first discussion about what actions, what tangible actions we were gonna take in the near time uh, to change the culture and how the Army viewed the network and then start moving forward. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to mention those things up front. So that said, um, uh, uh, a couple of points that, that, that I wanted to make here in, in kind of closing remarks. Um, we've, uh, we're going to have a discussion about a lot of things, and we're going to deliver a lot of things in the next 12 to 24 uh, to 36 months. But at the foundation of that has been the realization of the things that have been captured in our national uh, defense strategy. When we start to have a dialogue and discussion about this era of great power competition, you hear a lot of that, all right? Uh, you hear things like what's on page 10, where it says it doesn't matter, it's not just about who gets there first, all right? When in the context of innovation, it's about who's able to capture that technology and evolve that technology over time. But just so that you, you, you know, for clarity, when I start to talk about uh, the idea, the big idea of modernizing the network and how significantly different it's going to be in this, I'll use my air quotes, era of great power competition, there, there's really four things uh, that I call out as characteristics. And again, these are Crawford's words, all right? My, my, my understanding of this, and I just pass that on to you. The first characteristic of this uh, and thing that makes this era of great power t competition and our ability to modernize the network and the task of modernizing a network significantly different is speed, okay? It absolutely has to do with all things related to speed. Steve has talked about it in the context of where he's going with information warfare, all right? I talk about in the context of being able to uh, enable our, our, our uh, warfighter, uh, enable the user, whether they're sitting in the Pentagon at the Enterprise or they're sitting in a talk somewhere down at the tactical edge to be able to orient, decide, and act faster than peer adversaries. All right? And so the characteristic number one that I believe makes this era of great power competition significantly different actually has to do with speed. Uh, the second characteristic I talked about a little bit earlier. We scratched, uh, we scratched at it a little bit in the panel up here, and then I stood up and said something about it. One, because I'm passionate about the subject, but two, um, we can't get there anywhere north of where we are now without solving this, is the race for talent, all right? The race for the right skills at the right time inside the Army. And so immediately when we start having a discussion about talent, what's the first thing we talk about? We talk about we need more data scientists, right? We think we need, we talk about we need more computer scientists. We need more data analysts. We need more data strategists. Let's also add on to that, we need contract writers who are proficient in writing cloud contracts, okay? We need people in the contracting community who are proficient in writing good AI contracts, all right? We need lawyers. Uh, who understand all things ethical, all things ethics associated with AI. So I bring that up to say the race for talent uh, is real, uh, okay, uh, and, uh, and the Army uh, wants to compete uh, in that space. But this is not a competition with our industry partners. Um, I, there, was a, there was a Forbes uh, study uh, done over the last 12 months, and they went out and they polled, uh, I think it was about 14 or 15 different titans of industry. And uh, anybody here want to guess what the number two uh, comment was uh, from industry? 
uh, on, on what, uh, what the big gap was going to be uh, in the near term? Anybody want to take, take that one? It's a, it's, it's a softball, okay? Or I'll answer it myself. It's people. Uh, it, it's the race for talent. And so this isn't just an inside the army thing, but my point is one, it's not just your traditional talent that we're looking for, that we got to open the aperture. And then two, we got to figure out how do we work this together? Because in my visits, and I won't get into which CEOs, uh, but there have been, I think in the last, uh, in the last four or five months, he and I have visited with three uh, personally uh, together, but there have been a total of five or six that I've talked to. Every one of them unsolicited mentioned this particular issue. So this is kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, this whole race for talent uh, is foundational to our ability to deliver the network uh, of the future. Um, the third uh, characteristic when I talk about this era of great power competition is acknowledgement of the capability and intent of, of peer adversaries. You need only to unpack and have a conversation about things like, uh, so we like to talk about supply chain, let's have a conversation about the cyber supply chain and all of the discussions that are ongoing now. It's not just a discussion about Huawei, it's not just a discussion about Hytera or, or ZTE, because those are the names that always come up when we start having this discussion. But how are we, the fundamental question and strategic question is, how do we come together, not as a whole of government, but of it as a whole of nation to get after this particular problem, all right? I, and, and the example I use is if General McQuestion owned a company, okay, and I've got a relationship with General McQuestion, I can control the relationship with her, but I can't control what's behind her, her tier two, her tier three, her tier four uh, cyber uh, supply chain providers. And so this particular problem is bigger than uh, the kind of, you know, uh, affected audience, which in this particular case w would be the government. And so where Steve and I are going with this is we've got to think our way through how do we partner with the defense industrial base and other non-standard partners to really take a more of a holistic approach to get after this idea of supply chain. Back to that fourth characteristic that I talked about, which is acknowledgement uh, of the capability intent uh, of uh, peer adversaries. Uh, the, the, the last one is the one that uh, normally takes all the oxygen out of the room when I start to talk about the characteristics uh, of, of uh, this era of uh, great power competition that have to do with the network. And uh, it's the last time that I'll use my air quotes, but it's the data problem, all right? Uh, it's all things that have to do with the, with the data problem. So you, you've got a chart up there for it right in front of you. I think it's the only one that I have, uh, and it has to do with the data problem. And so, uh, again, this is just Crawford's thinking here, and I offer this just uh, for, for context. Almost always, when you start to talk about data, you immediately leap to the technical solution. Uh, you don't have a conversation about uh, I, what, what I call the triad that's associated with data. And these are things that we're going to challenges that we're going to have to overcome. Uh, on the, if you thought about the triangle upside down on the upper left hand corner, uh, I would say uh, that you've got the data strategy. All right. Uh, and there are some specific uh, first principles that are associated with the data strategy and implementing the data strategy. And you've heard a couple of them, but I'll tell you, when you see the Army's data strategy, you're going to see first principles uh, highlighted. And there are a total of six of them, uh, and they're across the bottom. Uh, and, and you might go, blinding flash of the audience, I, I, I get it. Uh, a lot of people are talking about that. But what I'm telling you, we've taken the next step to actually assign standards to each one uh, of uh, those first principles uh, that are gonna, you know, so there are standards that'll be associated with making our data visible. Just because I put out a memo that says make your data visible, or Steve Fogarty puts out an operations order that said data will be visible, uh, that's not gonna solve the problem. So in the data strategy, when you get a chance to see it, you're gonna see specific standards, at least three, that drive us in that direction. Uh, the second first principle, the, it has to do, data has to be accessible. All right, and I won't read to you, uh, you know why data has to be accessible. It's gotta be understandable. 
Uh, right now, we've got structured data, we've got unstructured data. There are various states, and it kind of is where it is. Uh, but if we want to achieve uh, the outcomes, and that's ultimately our ability to properly leverage data, uh, we've got to fix the data problem. And the first part actually starts with the actual strategy. Uh, trusted, that's decision quality. Uh, we were having a discussion here about deep fake earlier. All right, uh, one, one of the big issues with that is it casts just enough doubt to cause you not to trust what you're looking at. In that particular case, it's the ability to manipulate uh, video. Uh, but think about the environment that we're in. Uh, think about the generational kind of changes, transformations, where uh, there is a growing over, the, over, I'd say, the last five or six or seven years, distrust in what used to be norms. All right? So you combine that with uh, untrusted data meaning I'm looking at it, but I'm not 100% sure that this is correct, uh, then now you're starting to impact operations. And, and so that's why uh, the trusted piece. And then it's got to be interoperable. Uh, I talked about where our data currently is. Uh, I'm not necessarily looking to move it, uh, but what we're trying to say is we're going to put standards in place. So some of it will end up in a cloud hosting environment. But I've talked to no expert yet that says that the future will not involve data centers. So there will be some of our data that will be, you know, reside uh, in data centers. But the question is, regardless of where it is, it's got to be interoperable. Uh, and then ultimately, it's got to be secure. And that's where we, we really partner uh, on the, and that's the, a big piece of what our senior leadership in the Army uh, are looking at. So, so I talked about a couple things. Uh, this idea of delivering a network uh, in the era of great power competition will be fundamentally different than anything that I think that we've done before. I've hit on the, what I believe are the four characteristics. I could get this wrong. Uh, the only thing that I'm 100% sure of, uh, that I don't have it 100% right. Uh, and, uh, and, and that you can probably uh, take to the bank. Uh, but we do have ideas on this. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and, and as, as, as I said, uh, you know, so the speed, the race for talent, the acknowledgement of the capability intent of pure adversaries and overcoming the data problem. Uh, I believe that in the next 12 uh, to 18 months, uh, I think that those will be among uh, the greatest challenges. If I had to predict uh, that those will be among the greatest challenges uh, that we've got uh, facing us. So here's what I didn't talk about. And I'll stop and we'll open up for questions because I know there's probably questions in this. I did not talk about really enterprise IT as a service. I mentioned it uh, and where it was born, uh, but uh, that's something uh, that uh, did not exist last year uh, at this particular time yet. It is going to fundamentally change how we modernize at 288 post camps and stations across the Army. It's going to inform the future. Uh, he and I made a conscious decision. The Army needed a hard right turn away from this idea that it's gonna, we're going to we're going to modernize 288 post camps and stations, and we're going to take 25 to 30 years to do it. All right? And the hard right turn was taking a step back and accepting some risk for the greater good uh, of the Army. So I hadn't talked about that. I hadn't talked about Enterprise Cloud Management Office. All right? Uh, the fact that as a part of, uh, so I talked about uh, the first corner uh, of, our, uh, of the triad, the data problem. Uh, we have had some discussions in this very room about cloud and the Army's game plan for cloud. Uh, I didn't talk about what I think is most one, of the, uh, one of the most important pieces of that triad, uh, which is culture, all right? In order to implement the data strategy, culture has to fundamentally change from an idea of owning things uh, to a look forward at I've got to implement uh, the strategy and I've got to implement these standards because the need to share outweighs this kind of mindset of, of owning things. And so if you've got questions on, on that, uh, we, we, we can have a conversation about that. Uh, since the focal point of this is cyber, I'll close just with a couple things for you to think about, all right, in terms of, of cybersecurity. So uh, I, I mentioned uh, already uh, the cyber supply chain issue and the strategic importance of that and how we've got to come together, uh, almost a whole of nation approach to that uh, vice just 
what's the government going to do or what's the DOD going to do and what's the Army going to do. But there have been two really uh, important uh, uh, NDAAs uh, in the last 24 months. One is 1647. Uh, that actually has to do with weapon systems. I think we've got a report out back to Congress on that on the 31st of December. Uh, the other is NDA 1650, uh, which gets into some very interesting things that have to do with our installations and our critical infrastructure uh, and, uh, and our uh, uh, control systems. Uh, and so uh, when you start to think about uh, the, the big ideas and the big things that have to do with cybersecurity, and this is kind of a get off the stage because I really didn't want to come up here and give a sermon. But I did want you to get a feel for what's kind of what's in our rucksack right now, and what are the big hard problems uh, Steve Fogarty and I are trying to solve to really get after uh, what the leadership of the Army uh, has prioritized. Uh, as I said before, uh, readiness, uh, modernization, reform, and assuring our allies remain priorities for the Army. But I also mentioned earlier. Uh, that uh, the 40th Chief of Staff of the Army has set as his number one priority uh, all things that have to do with people. And I've given you a couple of uh, snippets uh, on that. And so I'll, uh, I'll get off the stage now. Uh, if you've got uh, you know, uh, uh, any comments or observations uh, that you'd like to make, if you'd like to wave the white flag and say, Crawford, I, I think you got that wrong, I'll, I'm all ears. Uh, because remember what I said about the 100% factor. All right, that, that uh, give, given where we are and where we think we got to go, well, the only thing that we're 100% sure of is that we don't have 100% right. But what's different now is the willingness to accept risk, uh, informed risk, uh, not gamble, but the willingness to accept risk by the Army to do things differently, uh, to change kind of some of the outcomes based on where we were headed uh, before. So I'll just uh, close by saying thank you all very much again for what you do. And, uh, and for your contributions uh, to, uh, to getting us uh, to, to where we are right now. Uh, Army Strong, winning matters. Thank you. Hey, I forgot to mention for anybody who's got the really hard questions that I'm about to be a grandpa in another 90 days. And there's actually a pool going on what I will be called. I heard the great one is leading, by the way. Uh, and so, so anybody's got any, any thoughts on that? That's, I'm just not, I didn't put that in, but somebody did. And the great one is leading in, in, the, in the pool. Uh, I don't get the pick. I knew I could get this going. Oh, man, I, I don't like that. <laughs> any other great ideas? Uh, and oh, by the way, if you want to talk about anything I just talked about, feel, feel free. Yeah. Lori. Lori. <laughs> General Swan said, oh, here we go. Yeah. Hey, uh, so, sir, um, I know a lot of Army organizations are kind of standing up their own artificial intelligence mm -hmm. uh, efforts to look at managing data. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the Army kind of coalescing the AI problem when right. it comes to data management? All right. All right, Lori, you're a great straight woman. Yeah, All right. So, so, Matt Easley. Uh, when we started on this journey, uh, uh, the, the cloud discussion, uh, our, our secretary, our acting secretary, uh, 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 McCarthy, challenged us. We're having a conversation about, hey, look, so we've, we, we've called this pool of all these applications and all this data down to this many, and now we prioritize about 900. I think the number was about 871. Uh, that we prioritized. His first question was, great, all right, how does that affect long-range precision fires? We took a step back and said, here's what I'm looking for, all right, and this was months ago. Uh, what, I really, what I'm really interested in is which apps are we going to prioritize along with the Army's modernization priorities, with long-range precision fires being number one, and then do we have the right applications for Matt Easley to come in over the top of that and actually use the AI tools uh, that, that uh, he is in the process of developing? Uh, or, or evolving over time, they've already been developed and, and using. So that is exactly uh, the approach uh, that he wants us to use. When you actually get a chance to look at the data strategy, you will see that called out. Um, overnight, because I put out a data strategy, does that stop all of the disparate nature uh, and isolated nature of things happening? Absolutely. But remember, um, I, I, I literally, you know, we just we came up with this. But the thing that's at the bottom there, uh, it, that's what drove me, the culture. 
That's what drove me to tell the leadership, among the hardest things we're going to do in the next 10 years is implementing the data strategy. All right? It's going to require a culture change. It's going to require trust in places that uh, don't exist right now. Uh, and so I, I know that's the easy thing to roll out there. It's, oh, it's all about culture. And then th let the debate begin. But w w it's, it's there this time. So, so the approach we're taking is I can't go anywhere and have a conversation about data, uh, the data strategy, uh, cloud, without uh, Matt Easley and talking about his part. And so there's a Matt Easley piece with the AI task force. But if you go talk to the IPSA team, we took the data strategy and I said, I want the IPSA team to mark this up. Then we went to the Army Leader Dashboard team. I want the Army Leader Dashboard team uh, to mark this up. Uh, anybody here read the article written by two colonels, I think it is, called Data at the Speed of War? All right, I, I highly encourage you to go, you don't have to read the 22 or 23 page document that they wrote. Uh, but uh, they wrote an article probably about four months ago uh, while they were over in Afghanistan. It was called Data at the Speed of War. Uh, we were looking to put the strategy in the hands of those guys, and I'd like you to mark it up. So you illuminate a point. One, there has to be connective tissue between our plan uh, in the data strategy and the actual standards, APIs, et cetera, that we're looking to implement uh, and the work that Matt Easley is doing. But the second piece of it is there are other uh, live efforts that have been ongoing now in the Army for about 18 months that we have tried to take advantage of to give input uh, into the data strategy. Because they've done it. They literally have gone from this many authoritative data sources in some space down to this many. And G4, as an example, uh, our biggest data user out there is the law community, at least one of them. Uh, it, it would, uh, it's eye-watering how successful they've been uh, with divesting of non-authoritative data sources in, in their particular piece uh, of the missionary. Is that helpful? Yep. All right, thank you. Hey, the pool is still open on what I'll be called, so anybody got any? Grubby. <laughs> thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, sir, Jared Serby from Federal News Radio. Um, I, I take your point about the data strategy is not going to get everybody into line overnight, but, but is, it, is it in effect acquisition guidance for future systems, or to some extent is it also going to require people to bolt on some of the standardization to systems that are out there? It, it, it is. Uh, so so uh, a big partner in this is uh, Paul Ostrowski and, and, and Dr. Jetty. Uh, and so this is not being, I, th I think that's the crux of your question is, are you are you including the acquisition community? We we have to, all right. Uh, and and no no there there is a uh, so so we've learned this lesson the hard way, and uh, and I won't get into it because it's at a, at a different classification level. What happens when you bypass uh, data and you don't go back and, and sweep it up? What what happens? There's some interesting things associated with that. Uh, that, that can be left behind. And so uh, there, there's, a, there's a look back uh, at, the, at the current, and it's going to require some resources to do that. But there's a stake in the ground that we're putting there that says, henceforth and forevermore, here, here is how we're going to do business, if, that, if that's helpful. So yes, absolutely, there has to be a look back, because that's where a, a lot of our, uh, the, the critical, critical data, data elements that we have actually reside. So good, good very, very good question. Let's give General Crawford a big round of applause.